Hey everyone, welcome to the redux of What If Ox King Raised Goku. As many of you have probably guessed, I wasn't entirely happy with the original start to this story, and while I did like the foundations, there's a lot I would have liked to add had I known what I know now. To this end, I'll be rebooting the story, keeping the good, and expanding on what should have been expanded upon the first time. Speaking of expanding, why not help expand this channel's reach by liking the video and subscribing to the channel? To my surprise, only 12.2% of viewers are subscribed, so if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button, as it's free, tells the YouTube algorithm that you like my content, and makes sure you never miss out on an upload. But now that I've said subscribe way too many times in one sentence, let's begin what you're actually here for, the story. Our tale begins in age 737 with a sleeping child, lost and alone in space. He is among the last of his kind, a Saiyan named Kakarot. Thanks to the foresight of his father, little Kakarot has been dispatched to Earth in hope of avoiding whatever sinister fate the tyrannical Frieza has planned for the Saiyans. Finally, after many days among the stars, the boy's pod descends upon a nearby mountain range. However, these are not the familiar mountains of Mount Pauzu, but rather another set further to the west, Fire Mountain. Falling fast now, the Saiyan pod comes to a stop with a tremendous shattering noise as it smashes through the stained glass window of the Ox King and Ox Queen's bedchamber, raking a divot in their floor. For the Ox King, this is quite a sight to behold, but the Ox Queen has bigger things on her mind, namely giving birth. With a loud cry, a healthy baby girl is born, while from within the pod, a matron cry rings out. As the Ox Queen holds her daughter, the Ox King uses his mighty axe to pry open the pod and collect the child from inside. With glee, he tells his wife that it seems they have been blessed with both a son and a daughter today, and lays the boy in her arms as well. The Ox Queen smiles lovingly at the pair of infants as they nuzzle her, welcoming them both to this world, as behind her, Ox King pulls them all into a massive hug. After much deliberation, it's decided that they will raise this boy as well, who they name Wagyu, and present as the younger twin to their daughter, Chi Chi. They're a loving family, with the new parents doting on their son and daughter, as their kingdom also comes to adore the young prince and princess in no time at all. However, a few months into the young lives of Chi Chi and Wagyu, tragedy strikes, and illness claims the life of the Ox Queen. Now a single father, Ox King does all he can to care for his children, showering them with gifts and attention, anything he can to see them smile. This forges a close bond between the trio, with the twins coming to realise that beneath his scary exterior, their dad is just a big teddy bear who loves to joke and tell them stories of his days training with his old friend Gohan and the legendary turtle hermit Master Roshi. As for the relationship between Chi Chi and Wagyu, they get on just fine despite being polar opposites in many ways. Chi Chi is well-mannered and outwardly demure, while possessing a strong will, insatiable ambition, and a wicked temper for those who cross her. Wagyu on the other hand is carefree, fun-loving, and driven by a desire to always test his limits. However, despite this there is a strong sense of familial love between the pair, with Wagyu proudly protecting his sister from anything that might scare her, while she in turn protects him from his own sheer boneheadedness. This unfortunately is a trait that no amount of royal training can cure him of, as despite the castle staff's best efforts to mould Wagyu into a fine prince, teaching him etiquette and diplomacy, which do make him generally more polite than his canon counterpart, he still has a knack for getting himself into trouble. As the one most commonly by his side, this frequently leaves Chi Chi exasperated, lambasting her brother for his carelessness, even if she does enjoy the little adventures they go on together, whenever his persuasive personality overrides her good sense. Unfortunately, despite this, things are not entirely as rosy as they appear, as the cost of now raising two children, one of whom eats his weight and food daily, coupled with Ox King's desire to create the best life possible for his children, drives him and his armies to begin raiding nearby settlements for their treasure. As a result, he will often be away for weeks at a time, and this saddens Chi Chi and Wagyu to see their father go, with the boy more than once asking if he can join in on these raids, always to no avail. Perhaps it would have been better had Ox King said yes, however, as one evening, while the prince and princess are waiting for their father's return, they decide to play a game of hide and seek. Wagyu, knowing that his sister will never think to look for him up there, decides to scale one of the castle's towers and hide up on the roof. Unfortunately, as he pokes his head over the parapet, something large and luminous catches his eye. The full moon. Down below, Chi Chi lets out a terrible shriek, as from her window she sees a giant ape rampaging across the castle roof. 
Guards naturally try to subdue this monster, but it does little good, as their halberds and bows do little more than irritate the ape. It seems like the castle is destined to fall, until from the distance, a mighty horn blast sounds, signalling the return of the Ox King and his knights. Chi Chi immediately rushes to her father's side, and with panic in her voice, tells him about the monster attack, and how she can't find Wagyu anywhere, since he's probably still hiding. This worries the king, who promises to stop the monster and find her brother. He and his men then make their way up to the top of the castle, where the giant ape is causing chaos. And with a mighty bellow, Ox King challenges the beast to battle. Ox and ape then charge at each other, fists raised, but thankfully the king is smarter than the brute, and so hurls his giant axe at its leg. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, this attack misses the leg entirely, cleaving through the monkey's tail instead. And just like that, the battle is over, as the beast lets out one last furious roar, then begins shrinking down, losing its fur, and becoming... Wagyu? Cradling the unconscious child in his arms, Ox drapes his cloak over his son to keep him from catching a chill, and tells his assembled soldiers never to mention what they just saw, even to Wagyu himself. One day perhaps the boy will be ready to learn what happened, but for now he deserves his innocence. And if the day should come where Wagyu must be told about his monkey form, he ought to learn the dreadful secret from his father, not random gossip. Chi Chi is of course delighted to see her father and brother returning safely, though like any child would, she has questions. Sighing deeply, Ox tells her that he managed to drive the ape demon away, and then found Wagyu. A technically true statement, but one built on heavier missions. This becomes the official line throughout Fire Mountain, though as rumours tend to do, it spreads, with some whispering that the Ox King actually captured the ape demon, and can unleash it on his foes at will. This legend draws the attention of many, both the benevolent and less so, with people from around the world flocking to see the sight of the battle with the ape demon. One such visitor is a man who calls himself Blue, and says that he has a proposition for the Ox King. Ox says that he is listening, and so Blue explains that he represents a group called the Red Ribbon Army, whose whole mission is to protect humanity from threats such as the Ape Demon. For that reason, they'd like to install a garrison here on Fire Mountain to investigate this monster sighting, and use their findings to improve their technology. And in exchange, they will share anything they develop with the King and his men, so that if such a threat arises again, they will be ready. Optimistically, Ox King thinks that this could be beneficial to keep everyone safe, but at the same time, is cognizant enough to know that he probably shouldn't let these guys be around Wagyu, just in case they figure out that he was the ape. For that reason, he decides that it's time for his children to experience life beyond the mountain, and so contacts his old master, asking if he would be willing to take them on as his students. Roshi is delighted to hear from Ox King, though laughs that he's too old for such things, prompting the Ox to beg until finally Roshi relents. The next day Wagyu and Chi Chi are informed of their departure, and while Wagyu is over the moon with excitement, Chi Chi is less so, complaining that she doesn't want to leave her home for some dinky little island, especially when that handsome and charming General Blue is about to move in. Comfortingly, Ox King tells her that this will be good for her, but when even this fails to appease the stubborn girl, he plays his trump card, innocently telling her that she doesn't have to go. That's fine. Though it'll mean Wagyu being out in the wide world on his own. Shuddering at what horrible fates could befall her sweet dopey brother in such a scenario, Chi Chi at last relents, though it is with incredibly ill grace, as she tells her father that was a dirty trick. The siblings then depart for Kame House, where they are greeted not only by the Turtle Hermit, but also by his newest pupil, a noseless bald boy named Krillin. Thanks to the knowledge of what Ox King will do to him if he ever finds out that he sent his kids out to pick up girls for him, Roshi chooses to skip that particular trial, instead getting right to their training. The early days are challenging, with Chi Chi constantly objecting to the gruelling menial labour like delivering milk or ploughing fields, while Krillin attempts to use trickery and flattery to connive his way out of the more strenuous tasks. Roshi will have none of this, and so punishes them both by denying them meals until they start to take their lessons seriously. Kind-hearted Wagyu attempts to slip the pair food once or twice, but quickly learns that this achieves nothing except getting his own meals taken away as well. Though these tactics do little to endear him to his students, they do finally manage to get them to do as they're told, albeit more out of spite and self-preservation than a genuine desire to learn. No matter, that can come later. 
And so day by day, Wagyu, Chi Chi and Krillin begin to not only build up their bodies, but also a sense of camaraderie that even extends to Roshi when he starts feeding them again. Eventually, Roshi mentions his intention to enter them all in the upcoming World Martial Arts Tournament in a few months, and this inspires the kids to work even harder, a three-way rivalry sprouting up as each of them wants to prove to the others and to themselves how far they have come as martial artists. This at last creates the sense of drive and devotion Roshi had wanted to see in his students, with the trio helping each other to grow, such as the earnestness of the Ox siblings encouraging Krillin to eschew his more sneaky tricks in favour of hard work, or the way Wagyu and Krillin are able to encourage Chi Chi to be a feisty self, rather than play the demure little princess she always felt she had to be. As for Wagyu, he needs all the help he can get when Roshi implements the study portion of his training, and thankfully, Chi Chi and Krillin are more than happy to act as tutors, with Chi Chi even finding an old fan Roshi threw away to hit her brother with when he slacks off. As it turns out, this is the legendary Bansho fan, with it creating a massive whirlwind which sends Wagyu crashing through the wall of Kame House the first time Chi Chi smacks him with it. This comes as quite a shock to everyone, most of all Wagyu, or from the living room, Roshi informs the kids they won't be having any more meals until they fix the hole they made in his house. Nonetheless, he is impressed with the natural proficiency with which Chi Chi wielded the fan, gifting it to her in the hope that it will be more use to the girl than it was to him as a potholder. Wanting to keep things fair, he also decides to give each of the boys a gift, presenting both his old flying Nimbus as well as a stack of dirty magazines, an instruction for Wagyu and Krillin to decide among themselves who gets what. Having hung around the guards barracks quite a bit in his youth, Wagyu is well aware of what pornography is, though he has little interest in it, saying he'd rather have the cloud. However, as a point of politeness, he'll let Krillin choose first, with the bald monk in turn adopting a humble expression, as he says that as a testament to their friendship, he'll let Wagyu have the cloud since he wants it, while he'll graciously take the inferior prize. Unfortunately for Krillin, no one but Wagyu buys this act, with Chi Chi and Roshi seeing the bold boy's eagerness as he scoops up his gift and scarpers away, though neither say anything since it seems that everyone is happy with their gift. From here training resumes as per usual, with the three turtle students growing exponentially, their youthful enthusiasm mixed with their rivalry pushing them to higher heights than even Roshi could have imagined possible at such a young age. For Wagyu and Chi Chi, this also involves practicing with their gifts, as while Roshi forbids them from using them in their day-to-day -day training, wanting his students to grow without relying on tools, he does encourage them to spend their downtime in additional training, with Wagyu quickly growing increasingly skilled at flying on his Nimbus, while Chi Chi finds the Bansho fan to be incredibly helpful, both as a melee weapon and for its ability to attack at range by summoning whirlwinds. However, this is not the only extracurricular training the Ox siblings get up to, as when they feel as though they have gotten a handle on the basics, they begin imploring Master Roshi to teach them the Kamehameha from their dad's stories. Having been impressed by his students' determination thus far, Roshi admits that maybe one of them could learn it, though he warns that it took him 50 years to perfect. This makes Chi Chi grimace that she'll be as old and wrinkly as Roshi by the time she masters it then, but the old hermit draws her out of her reverie with a light bonk on the head with his staff, telling her that the Kamehameha is only for the most serious and disciplined martial artists, so if she wants to learn it, she'll have to stick with it to the very end, as will her brother, as he doesn't share his secret with dilettantes. Having already internalised the work hard portion of the turtle school ethos, the young prince and princess are happy to accept these terms, with even Krillin joining in once he hears about this extra training, both to avoid being left behind, as well as to impress Chi Chi, who he has started developing a little crush on. In order to teach them about the Kamehameha, Roshi must first teach the kids about Ki, with this often taking the form of metaphysics lectures. Chi Chi, being a bright girl, is mostly able to keep up, while Krillin does okay after a little bit of tutoring, but poor Wagyu is left up a creek without a paddle, and Roshi wonders if he'll even have a chance of learning the Kamehameha after 50,000 years. However, these fears are all laid when it comes time for a practical demonstration. After witnessing Roshi perform the move just once, Wagyu is able to perform a passable imitation that makes Roshi's eyes almost fall out of his head. Maybe he's had this ox prince wrong from the start, and he's not a blockhead at all. He's a genius! Unfortunately, this too is an incorrect assessment, as Roshi soon comes to realise. Accepting that Wagyu is no genius, he just has a gift for battle the likes of which the turtle hermit has never seen before. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for Krillin and Chi Chi, who despite their best efforts, cannot emulate Wagyu's success. Not wanting them to grow discouraged, Roshi tries his best to comfort them, reminding the pair that this is the result he expected, with Wagyu being the oddity. Wanting to help his friend and sister, Wagyu also attempts to coach them, as thanks for all the tutoring they gave him, though all he really manages to do is further complicate the situation, as his success was instinctual, and instinct cannot be taught. As a result, neither Chi Chi nor Krillin can perform the attack by the time the tournament rolls around, though thankfully, Roshi has a way to lift their spirits, presenting all three of them with a turtle school gear to wear in the tournament, expressing great pride in how far they have all come, and claiming that they've earned it. Gratefully, the kids all thank their master, then after getting changed into their new orange attire, catch their plane to Papaya Island.
Due to Fire Island being a small and fairly isolated kingdom, and Kami House being so secluded, the hustle and bustle of the tournament grounds were an assault on Wagyu and Chi Chi's senses, with even Krillin needing a moment to adapt after spending so many months on the island. Nonetheless, the spectacle more than makes up for it, with Roshi fondly telling the kids to go enjoy themselves, though with a stern instruction to be back in time for the qualifying rounds. Taking their master's words to heart, Wagyu, Chi Chi and Krillin spend the next hour exploring the area around the arena, as well as visiting a few small vendors who have temporarily set up shop to capitalise on the tournament's popularity. Though Wagyu wants to keep going, especially when he comes across the row of food vendors, Chi Chi forces him and Krillin to return to the intro when their hour is up, and it is good that she does, as barely five minutes later, they are called to participate in their first matches. For the prelims, each fighter is placed into one of eight brackets, with the winner of each making it to the main stage, where they can compete for the championship. Fortunately, the three total students are sorted into separate brackets, meaning that for now, they don't have to worry about fighting a friend, with each easily advancing to the top of their brackets as a result. For Krillin, this is especially sweet, as he gets to show just how much he's grown by clobbering his old bullies from the Oran Temple, and do so in front of Chi Chi, who proudly cheers him on while waiting for our next opponent. Finally, the top eight are selected, with them being Wagyu, Chi Chi, Krillin, Bacterian, Ranfan, Giran, Nam, and Jackie Chun, who Chi Chi immediately recognizes as Roshi in a wig. Excited at their success, the kids attempt to seek out Roshi to celebrate, though, oddly enough, he is nowhere to be found, with the trio only holding their search when it comes time to fight. First up among them is Krillin, who faces off with Bacterian like in canon, resulting in a very similar fight, with the only noticeable difference being that Krillin is slightly stronger due to having a second rival, and that his Chi Chi reminds him that he doesn't have a nose while snapping at him to stop fooling around. Following this is Jackie Chun vs Nam, with Chun, or rather Roshi, being surprised at how serious of a fighter Nam is, considering how the rest of the fighters have turned this tournament into a glorified carnival. Peeking into Nam's mind to get a look at what might be fueling this attitude, Roshi finds the young man's motives are pure, with Nam needing the prize money to buy water for his arid village. Feeling great sympathy for his opponent, Roshi kindly informs him that he need not worry about the tournament, as he knows another way to get the water to Nam's village. Thinking the old man is mocking him, Nam goes on the attack, proving himself a formidable fighter by employing deft kicks and chops to try and knock his foe out. For the most part, Roshi is impressed, though being a master martial artist, he quickly finds the flaw in Nam's technique. It is too rigid and serious, and so to combat this, Roshi begins utilizing the drunken fist, with the lurching unpredictability of this fighting style throwing Nam off. Seeing no alternative, the younger man resorts to his finishing move, the Heaven Cross, with him leaping into the air and coming down like a missile aimed right at Roshi. In a humble voice, he apologizes, saying the old man will be left comatose for several days, though with a feigned drunken stumble, Roshi proves this wrong by dodging at the last second, only to slam a kick into Nam's falling backside that redirects him, so he crashes headfirst into the wall around the spectator's area, disqualifying him by ring out. Hanging his head in shame, Nam apologizes to everyone back home for failing them, though hopping down from the ring to stand beside him, Roshi hands the other man a capsule, promising this should be able to hold enough water for everyone, causing Nam to break down in tears as he declares that great Jackie Chun has saved his village. Smiling kindly, Roshi tells Nam to think nothing of it, though if he'd like to pay him back, there is one favor he might ask. And so it is that when Chi Chi enters the ring for her match against the purple-haired fighter Ranfan, she is shocked to see Master Roshi waving at her, while beside him stands Jackie Chun, throwing her previous theory about him into doubt. Nonetheless, she has bigger matters to concern herself with right now, such as how she's going to defeat an opponent who is older and likely more experienced than herself. However, as it turns out, this is giving Ranfan way too much credit. As though she looks confident on the outside, inside she's sweating bullets. Why the hell did she have to get matched up with the girl? If she'd gotten any of the men, she could have used her tricks and wild to score an easy win, but against this kid she's got nothing. Well, almost nothing. There's always plan B. To this end, when the gong sounds, Ron Fun stands still, allowing Chi Chi to charge at her, only to collapse at the last second, sobbing that she's too frail to withstand another hit. While this might have fooled one of the guys, Chi Chi just watches this with disgust, telling her to knock it off, since she's giving female fighters a bad name, before giving her one last chance to get up and fight honorably. Seeing that plan B has failed, Ranfan improvises, lunging at Chi Chi from the ground in the hope that she can push her out of the ring, figuring she can't weigh that much being a kid and all. Unfortunately, this fails to take into account that Chi Chi is also a true martial artist, meaning that when Ranfan makes contact with her, the girl just stands firm, negating the attack and causing their eyes to meet for a moment, before Chi Chi sighs that Ranfan's family clearly raised her wrong as she smacks her on top of the head and ends the match by knockout. Following this is Wagyu's match with Giran, which goes like canon, including him regrowing his tail and terrifying the dinosaur man into surrender. Likewise, Krillin's match with Jackie Chun also plays out like in canon, securing Roshi's place in the finals and setting up the second semi-final clash to be Chi Chi vs Wagyu. 
Ever since they made it through the preliminaries, both siblings knew that it could come to this, though it doesn't make it any easier, at least not for Chi Chi, who admits that she doesn't want to beat on her goofy little brother. In contrast, Wagyu seems over the moon at this opportunity, telling his sister not to worry about it, since this is a chance for them to test themselves and see how much they've really learned under Master Roshi. Truthfully, Chi Chi isn't entirely convinced. Though figuring it would be disrespectful to pull her punches, she nods that she supposes Wagyu is right, before clasping his hand and declaring that may the best martial artist win. At this moment, they are joined by a trio of supporters, those being Roshi, now looking like himself again, as well as Krillin and Ox King. Smiling at the sight of their friends and dad, the twins ask what they're doing here, with Roshi and Krillin saying they want to wish the siblings luck, while Ox King gives a blustery chuckle as he declares that he wouldn't miss watching his kids battle it out in their first tournament for all the riches in the world. He then bursts into tears at the sight of them in their turtle school geese, saying it reminds him of his own youth with Gohan, while Roshi gently pats him on the back, telling him to come along, since it's time for the kids to begin their match. Stepping into the ring, Chi Chi and Wagyu take their places, then on the gong rush at one another, exchanging a flurry of punches and kicks of roughly even power. Thanks to his natural genius when it comes to combat, Wagyu soon begins to pull ahead, pushing Chi Chi back, though the Ox Princess will not go down without a fight, having worked herself to the bone to keep up with her brother and Krillin. Subsequently, it is from the latter rival whom she draws inspiration now, dodging out of the way of a hit and grabbing hold of Wagyu's tail in an attempt to spin him round. However, what she does not expect is that the moment her hands lock around the furry appendage, her brother goes limp, collapsing to the ground and groggily muttering that he feels weird. Briefly, Chi Chi considers letting go and checking on Wagyu, but this instinct is quickly pushed to the side as she reminds herself of her promise to hold nothing back, reasoning that she can check on her brother after she rings him out. She then hoists the boy into the air like she's done countless times with a banjo fan and swings him by his tail until she has a good rotation going, at which point she lets go and sends him flying. For a moment it seems like her victory is assured, though just before Wagyu can hit the ground, another oddity occurs. In this case, it is what the boy does with his tail, as by drawing inspiration from his sister, he spins it like a helicopter blade, allowing him to hover over the grass, then float back to the ring, meaning the match is not yet over. Laughing, Wagyu asks his sister whether she thinks this new trick is neat too. This is only met by an onslaught of blows, as Chi Chi draws more on her fiery spirit, like Wagyu and Krillin had taught her to. Grinning that she's really taking things seriously, the Ox Prince begins to fight more strategically, using what he learned from her to match his twin, with the ensuring display of fisticuffs wowing the spectators with how much proficiency these two young martial artists have attained. However, being young, there is only so much exertion their small bodies can handle, with it quickly becoming a question of who will tire first. Unsurprisingly, the biology of a race bred for battle proves superior in this regard, with Wagyu being the one who remains standing after Chi Chi collapses from exhaustion, but when the 10 count finishes, the boy helps his sister to her feet and thanks her for an amazing battle. Following this comes Wagyu vs Jackie Chun, which goes like canon, though with one distinct difference, that being that when the rising of the full moon causes Wagyu to transform into a great ape, Chi Chi recognizes this form as the ape demon who attacked Fire Mountain. Rounding on her father, she demands to know if he knew about this, with the bearded giant blustering that he did, but he swears he had a good reason for keeping it a secret, since he didn't want it getting out, and Wagyu becoming the target of fear and hate, or worse, being used as a weapon by those who'd only see the power the form grants, and not the danger. Seeing the wisdom in her father's words, Chi Chi forgives him for keeping this secret, though asks what they're gonna do, with Ox suggesting he could cut off Wagyu's tail again. However, from the ring, Roshi retorts that he has a more permanent solution, firing off Kamehameha and destroying the moon. Following this, the events of the fight return to their usual path, with Roshi's longer legs still winning the day. As he had hoped, this imparts the lesson there will always be a stronger opponent so they cannot afford to be complacent to his students, with them promising to train even harder so they can win the next tournament in three years. Satisfied with this result, Roshi decides to take everyone out to dinner, having mysteriously come into a large sum of money recently. However, it seems not everything can be good news, as just before the disciples of the Turtle School both past and present can dig into their meal, a most troubling bulletin flashes across the television screen located in the corner of the restaurant. The Red Ribbon Army have just begun their campaign of global conquest, and their first target is none other than Fire Mountain. And that's where we'll leave things for now. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts, suggestions, or screams of rage in the comments below.